So I'm a little late on this news, but I've gotten a lot of questions about John Lennon's recent win at the Salt Classic GT, bring in our very own Buggy Boys to the table, and taking it down with a 5-0 record at the end of the day, the only undefeated player in the event. So, just a scant few days ago, so I figured I'd take the opportunity to go through John Lennon's lists, do an analysis of his matchup, and talk about what it takes to bring Tyranids to a 5-0 undefeated record at a GT. Let's do it! What's up folks, welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi and today we're gonna be talking about John Lennon's list at the Salt Classic GT that he recently took down with the Tyranids. For those who don't know, John Lennon's a member of Team Art of War and does a lot of streaming and content creation over there on that channel. Highly recommend you check his stuff out. They're all very competitive players. They they live together in a team house and do nothing but play 40k all the time, which is like, I mean, that's the dream, right? So clearly they, they mostly know what they're talking about. And John can back that up now with a GT win with Tyranids under his belt. So let's talk about the list he took to the event. Just before we get started, as a real quick reminder, if you like this style of content, you like talking about Tyranid lists and how to win with Tyranids and, and 40k tactics and competitive stuff, go ahead and drop the video a like, drop a subscribe. I talk about that stuff all the time and it helps let me know what kind of videos y'all like to see so I can make more of them and then you can watch them and then I can make more and then you can watch them. But anyway, let's get into this list. And for this event, John took a very classic Kronos plus Kraken combo, bit of a mid-range Tyranid list, 8th edition style, but with a little 9th edition flair, we got some Imperial Armor Compendium options getting brought in. So this list starts with a High Fleet Kronos Patrol, led by a Neurothrope, bringing a unit of Ripper Swarms, as well as a unit of Hormagons to the table, backed up by some powerful shooting, Hive, six Hive Guard, as well as an Exocrine, enhanced resistance on those Hive Guard as well, to protect them from enemy artillery shooting back at them. And then following that up with a High Fleet Kraken Battalion running the Swarm Lord, a Winged Hive Tyrant, and a bit, of, a bit of an interesting Hive Tyrant build. We've got the wings, we've got the Adrenal Glands, as is to be expected, but then a set of Devourers and a set of Rending Claws. And I'll get to the reason behind that in a second. We also have the Resonance Barb on that guy for that additional cast every turn. Hive Tyrant's one of my favorite places to put the Resonance Barb since they can actually use all three casts, and getting three casts at plus one is the maximum you can get in your Tyranid army. Potentially four casts if you uh, if you drop all the CP to give him the Swarm Lord's powers and then cast an additional time, which is kind of sick, right? <laughs> You're getting uh, essentially plus four to cast over the entirety of the Psychic Phase, which is like pretty big deal. We also have two more units of Hormagants in that detachment, one of 10 and one of 20, as well as a unit of 30 Termagants with Devourers coming in out of that January FAQ. Seven points a model, pretty sweet. We also have Elixir in that detachment and Pièce de Résistance, two Dimacarons, one upgraded with di Accelerated Digestion. There's our Imperial Armor Compendium Spice coming at you. Now this is obviously a pretty, pretty well-rounded list. We have a good breadth of damage output. The Dimacarons and the guns are good at smashing heavy armor. And then we have all the Termagants with their Devourers and the Hive Tyrants Devourers as well to clear out infantry. Can also pull double duty with stuff like the Exocrine. That's a good sort of mid-range profile. It's good at killing infantry because it's got a lot of attacks. It's good at killing armor because it's high AP, reasonably high damage. So this list can fight a wide variety of defensive profiles pretty well. The Demacarons also pull a little bit of double duty fighting hordes because of that Thorax Spine Mot ability, although a lot of times if your opponent isn't a powerful melee unit themselves, they'll just pull out of melee with you and you won't get your Thorax Spine Mot attacks after you make your normal attacks, but if you do get them off uh, in some particular matchups that I'll talk about in a sec, it actually can, can deal some significant damage. They can really put a hurt on uh, infantry units with that ability. We also have a good swath of support options in here. We have the Ripper Swarms and the Hormagons and the Lictor in order to perform our secondary objectives. Hormagons are an incredible pick to do a lot of secondary objectives like deploying Scramblers because they're a base movement of eight, which means that if even if they're entirely inside your deployment zone, as long as they're, they're not farther than like two inches back, they can just make a standard move and without the need to metabolic overdrive, they can get in and deploy a Scrambler in the center of the table. And then you have the Lictor to come in late game and pop in your opponent's deployment zone and complete that secondary super easily. Same goes for banners or a lot of other action specific secondaries. Hormagons are they're just great, man. Like normally you'd be like, well, I kind of want more like a, a higher volume of models, so I'll take a bunch of termagants. But the Hormagons move eight is so good on those things. Now, beyond being a pretty well-rounded list, what in particular is this list good at? 
And the number one thing is that it's good against slow, sort of heavily armored uh, enemies. So if you're talking about something like Terminators, they're just going to be moving, you know, five inches across the table or so. If they don't pack a lot of heavy weapons, they can't really shoot down the, those Dimacarons at range. And the Dimacarons are are just going to run absolute circles around them. Like there's no way that they get to engage a Dimacaron without you making a huge mistake. And the Kraken player just gets to commit into melee with them whenever it is convenient for them, essentially. A lot of the metagame right now is focused on short ranged anti-tank weapons, things like multi meltas and and uh, plasma eradicators and stuff like that. And one way you can protect the macarons from that is just using that high fleet Kraken mobility to actually just back deploy them out of range. So your opponent doesn't even get the opportunity to attack them before you've decided to commit them in. That doesn't work quite as well for long range anti tank firepower. So, matchups like Adeptus Mechanicus or other matchups that have like super long range LAS cannon equivalent weapons, there's no way to protect the Dimacarons unless the terrain is very favorable to you. That being like big opaque walls, like the WTC style L's, that you can physically hide those Dimacarons behind. And looking at the terrain setups for the tournament it doesn't look like that is how the terrain was was laid out so unfortunately the Demacrons do need a little bit of a favorable setup to be very good and um, especially into those shooting heavy matchups and unfortunately that just wasn't the case so we're kind of looking to dodge like the uh, the iron strider ballastari i spam or a bunch of retributors or something because those would just rip the the Demacrons off the table very quickly but if you have a good read on the meta and you're not expecting those to come in in great numbers, a lot of times you can just dodge that matchup and you'll be okay. Now, talking about some interesting synergies in the list, I like that the Termagants have been put into the High Fleet Kraken detachment. That actually gives them a little bit of additional mobility. You can still opportunistic advance that unit and use Onslaught on them to ignore the, the move and shoot penalty with Devourers, which means that that unit can be moving 18 inches before it shoots. So they have a pretty respectable threat range at 36, which really fixes some of the mobility problems that those Devourer uh, Termagants have because, they're, I mean, they are pretty slow. Like, they're, <laughs> they're slow and short-ranged, and they're not very resilient, so they can't exactly, you know, pop out of cover before it's time to shoot. So a lot of times you would sort of audible them into the Kronos detachment so that you can Symbiostorm them if you need to. This is actually a really interesting counterpoint, a little bit of synergy that I think it's really easy to overlook. Also, the Lictor in there lets you Pheromone Trail those guys onto the table if they're in Strategic Reserve. So for an additional one CP, I think it costs three in total to bring the Termagant unit alongside the Lictor um, onto the table from Deep Strike. That lets you put them basically anywhere. And that really helps their mobility as well. So this list is actually pretty good at delivering those 30 Devourers onto your opponent. We also have the Hive Tyrant with that interesting uh, tyrant build, kind of a, a mid-range tyrant with one set of melee weapons and one set of devourers. Now, a lot of times when you're building these melee tyrants, you want to bring the scything talons to give them a little bit more consistency with their hit rolls and just use voracious appetite to get around their kind of low strength value because then you get that flat three damage, you get to really, you know, chew things up in melee. But, I mean, this is a double Dimacaron list that a voracious appetite is going to be spent on the Dimacarons every single turn that they are in melee. So... For the most part, you're not going to have access to that stratagem. So putting the Rending Claws on, the, on this guy, in addition to just being cheaper, which is solid, also gives him access to full rerolls, despite the fact that it's lower damage output. He still isn't going to need that stratagem in order to be combat effective in melee. The downside of, of paying for the guns on this dude is that he hit and runs a little bit worse than just a standard smashy hive tyrant would. A lot of times what you can do is use this guy offensively in the psychic phase and assuming that you're not bulleting something into your opponent's army with the swarm lord, which most a lot of the times you don't need to. Either you don't need to double move them to get there or they don't have any good targets that you're really going to commit into and you can kind of play keep away with the Dimacarons early. And having this Hive Tyrant just run out to drop a bunch of offensive powers on somebody, then using Hive Commander to move him back into cover behind Obscuring Terrain is super duper useful. The downside is you are paying for those Devourers and you can't use the Devourers on the turns that you Hive Commander, which is a little unfortunate and in some situations makes him a little bit less efficient. But that said, I'm sure that Devourers are, are a pretty good include just to supplement your anti-infantry shooting uh, from those Termagants. We also have the Resonance Barb on that guy. I mentioned before, I really like the Resonance Barb on Hive Tyrants. It gives you so many casts at plus one. It's super good. That said, I think we are a little light on support casts in this list. I would like to see one more Neurothrope in there. That would pull Catalyst off of the Swarm Lord and open him up to either get a second instance of Psychic Stream. So when this Hive Tyrant dies, which he will, I mean, he, he, that dude is a, a bullet magnet, then the Swarm Lord's going to be able to follow up 
and continue to uh, put two smites onto people every turn that he's not uh, casting his support powers. That also gives you a little bit more redundancy on Catalyst because you reroll your ones, so it, it goes off a little bit more frequently. And you get up to that sweet five smites on the early game before any of your psychers die, which is uh, which is always nice. I don't know what you drop in this list to fit another turn Neurothrope in there, um, but uh, th I think that, that would be a change I would like to see. But lastly, Onslaught on this Hive Tyrant is actually a pretty good call. You only really need Onslaught rounds one and two. In round three plus, there's a pretty good chance the Hive Tyrant like ate a bunch of Melted Guns and died. So at that point, you won't need Onslaught anymore uh, outside potentially the Swarm Lord double moving somewhere to do something wild. So I kind of like putting it on this model that's probably not going to survive to the phase of the game where you no longer need his Psychic Power. I think that's that's a pretty smart place to put it. I also like the inclusion of the Exocrine in the list as well. I think Exocrines work particularly well with Dimacarons. Not only does your opponent have to break cover to deal with the Dimacarons, like they have to move out and actually shoot those guys, and the Dimacarons are going to be forcing them back in their deployment zone and attracting a lot of fire from your opponent's army. And that means that there are less attacks going into that Exocrine, and the Exocrine can play a little bit more aggressively since your opponent is dis is incentivized to attack the Dimacarons over him, since the Dimacarons are going to be up in their face, like, punching all their stuff to death. And that means that Exocrines in a Dimacaron list often just get to shoot for five turns, like, unimpeded. They're, they're the most survivable Exocrines you'll ever meet. It's kind of wild. So now that we've talked about the list, let's talk about the metagame that this list went into. Like I mentioned before, I think this list is particularly good against especially short-range shooting. It can use its mobility to sort of play a keep-away game against and kind of slow, heavily armored armies. And turns out that's mostly what we saw in this tournament. If we look at the top eight of the tournament, a lot of it is Terminator-focused Space Marine builds. We have an Emperor's Children Space Marine build, bringing Mortarian in there as well. We have Adeptus Custodes in there. We have a Death Guard with a bunch of Terminators. We have a lot of different Space Marine varieties, all with a bunch of Terminators. And man, I don't know if I could have picked like a, a, a more favorable meta game for these Dimacarons. Not only are the Dimacarons good at punching Terminators. I mean, they got a bunch of big attacks, winning on twos, potentially with rerolls. Any failed invulnerable save is just a dead Terminator. They kill them so efficiently. But also... Terminators do a ton of their damage in melee back to Dimacarons, and especially things like Dark Angel Terminators that really want to be getting like their reroll to wounds and their plus one to wound against these big heavy monsters. They are highly incentivized to not pull out of melee to deny your Thorax Spine Maw, which means oftentimes these Dimacarons just automatically kill another Terminator for free every turn and then trigger their, their free catalyst on themselves. It's like... It's really good, man. And also that accelerated digestion on that dude means that even if you get swung back into with a bunch of thunder hammers or something a lot of times you don't die just because they have the dimacrons have like an endless ocean of wounds and then you just get to heal yourself back unbracket yourself and like keep the train rolling it's it's a real good matchup and especially if your opponent doesn't have a lot of those big las cannon equivalent weapons that can hit the dimacrons before they they can favorably engage into the terminators it's so difficult for those terminator armies to win so let's talk about the lists that that john's list actually went up into and the matchups that it got now real quick before we get into this i do want to preface that I, I do mention a lot of very specific details about this list and that's because john wrote a battle report of all of his games in the tournament that unfortunately since i recorded the video has been taken down it was on frontline gaming uh and i can't find it anymore it goes to a 404 page now so that's where some of the pictures i had of this video came from and that's where a lot of the specific uh, game information comes from i hope that it goes back up so we can read exactly how the games went but for now unfortunately it is been lost to the the mists of the internet and round one we saw it play into a really interesting astro militarum plus imperial knights list bringing a knight castellan with a couple moiraxes in support as well as just a boatload of infantry we got a bunch of conscripts a bunch of infantry squads a couple of veterans for outflanking to bring in for through strategic reserve interestingly no manticores in this astro militarum uh, detachment manticores are are terrifying to a lot of tyranid lists not only are they decent at, at chipping wounds off of the big monsters like demacrons and like exocrines they're also absolutely lethal to hive guard and even though we have the enhanced resistance on that hive guard unit to keep it safe from enemy counter battery it's not going to be enough against a full payload manticore that thing shoots so many times wounding on twos 
and every single failed save is just a dead hive guard that that unit like the hive guard unit just gets decimated almost immediately and a lot of times you can't place them in cover because that would also mean that they're in line of sight and you just get shot by the castellan or whatever and the unit gets removed anyway which means you can't even get to the three plus armor save which i mean still they're gonna kill it with the with the full pale of manticore but that is a terrifying matchup and uh i think john was probably thanking his lucky stars he didn't see those those two manticores on the other side of the table that said the Knight Castellan is, you know, one of those really heavy, powerful ranged archetypes that I mentioned that can shoot across the table with a billion super high damage attacks. And if you're not behind Obscuring Terrain, he's just going to blast you off the table. And unfortunately, the Macarons are never behind Obscuring Terrain because that keyword does nothing for them. And uh, like I mentioned before, a lot of the terrain in this tournament was relying on that Obscuring keyword to block line of sight. And there was not a lot of natural LOS blocking. A lot of the ruins on the table had were, were very perforated. They have a lot of windows that you can see those Demacarons directly through and just kill them super easily. So this was probably very much a go-first uh, sort of matchup. I think there's a non-zero chance that, that at least one... If not, both Dimacarons are dead at the, the end of turn one, if that Knight Castle and gets to shoot at it with all of the buffs uh, available to it. And uh, fortunately, John run the roll to go first, and he sent a Dimacaron directly into the Knight Castle and, and uh, double fought and killed it. So easy game. You know, sometimes you just win the coin flip. I'm sure he was pretty happy to, to get out of that matchup. <laughs> Round two, the, the, the Terminator terminating began because we got uh, some Iron Hands with a big brick of Terminators. Looks like nine Assault Terminators <laughs> in one big unit, alongside some multi melt attack bikes and a couple Outriders and Inceptors. To add some flanking elements and a little bit of anti-tank firepower and a big Leviathan Dreadnought. And it sounded like uh, as soon as John was able to knock out the anti-tank shooting in this army, his last night Macaron and his fast elements just get to run circles around these these really slow Terminator Assault units. So uh, it looks like he lost the Dimacron early in the game to the Leviathan shooting. The second Dimacron was able to kill that Leviathan and then pull out of combat. And the rest of this slow Iron Hands army was really not able to, to do too much to him. Now, interestingly, I, I love there's one thing in this list I absolutely love, and it's this tactical squad in the back just bringing one Laz cannon. And the reason I love this is that so many lists right now are focusing on these like multi melt plasma eradicator, even just like 36 inch range ranged attacks for their anti tank. And if you have a, a tactical squad like sitting on an objective on your board edge, a lot of times your opponent is simply not in range to attack them. So for the same cost that you get an incursor squad for 105 points, you also get this last cannon shot that just gets to shoot probably for the entirety of the game. And there's nothing your opponent can do about it. I think that's actually kind of a fun include if you have those extra 15 points to spend. It's not super reliable, like one shot, BS3 is like fine, but just having the ability to poke at your opponent from 48 inches away with this unit feels like it's it's actually pretty good right now. I don't know a lot of armies that can deal with that unit, uh, you know, immediately to stop that last cannon from shooting. Round three, John was paired up against Nick Nanavati, fellow Art of War teammate, and Nick was playing Death Guard, and again bunch of Terminators on the table. So sensing a theme here. Now, I think John uh, might have might have done some some counter technology a little bit to Nick's list. These two being team members means I, I imagine that they they trade army lists quite often. And they play a lot. So John probably knew that this list was going to be in contention going into it. And uh, so <laughs> the list has 60 box walkers in it. That has to be one of the reasons that we're diverting so many points in this tiered list to anti-infantry shooting, because, I mean, he's got to know that this is going to be something that he'll have to deal with. And the tiered list being able to peel off those box walkers almost instantaneously with all those devourers means that there's very little board control that this Death Guard army has against him. Now, the two Contemptor Dreadnoughts are absolutely lethal, and they will they do have the ability to kill those Dimacarons super easily. But as soon as those Poxwalker screens are dead, the Dimacarons can just jump into a Contemptor Dreadnought, kill it, and then run away. And again, they're too fast for the Blight Lord and the Death Shroud Terminators to follow up and attack them. So you just get to run around, grab the objectives that you can... And then, you know, as soon as you have a favorable engagement with your paroxysm off, with all of your buffs in place, you can dive on those Terminators and deal a, bun a bunch of damage to them. It sounded like this was a sweep and clear matchup as well. So Nick was probably favored in terms of the mission and a couple weird things happened. You know, some some dice happened and some misplays happened on John's side, but he was able to pull it out. It sounded like it was actually a really sick game. <laughs> this was one I, uh, I think I would have liked to have watched. Now, that said, I don't think that Death Guard is always a, a particularly good matchup for Tyranids. Mortarian is 
basically unkillable. Uh, the faction has almost no answers to him. Assuming he gets his Miasma of Pestilence up, Dimacarons especially rely on their full rerolls to be able to kill these big heavily armored targets. And assuming his Gloaming Bloat is active, like they're hitting on fours, no rerolls, hit wounding on fours, no rerolls. So only 25% of their attacks even go through. And then he has a four plus invulnerable save into damage reduction, into damage resistance on top of that. And I think a Dimacaron averages like friggin' two or three damage against Mortarian. <laughs> they just do nothing, and he hits on twos, wounds on twos, swinging back at them uh, with full rerolls and just kills the Dimacaron in response. You essentially have to play a keep away game, and it's very difficult. And if the mission isn't conducive to it, you just sometimes just lose. But uh, Nick decided to, to shoot himself in the foot a little bit there, take some Poxwalkers instead of Mortarian, which uh, I think is, uh, in my opinion, is is the less effective of the, the varieties of Death Guard. I guess it's doing okay for him, although I think he ended 3-2 and two in this event, so not doing that okay. Maybe, maybe should have taken Mortarian there, Nick. Going on to the semifinals... John was paired against a mixed Eldari player with a really interesting style of Eldari bringing 80 racks. The event was, uh, I guess, using the t- the 20 man rack squads, which still not still not sure that that's uh, that that's rules as intended. But I guess they were uh, rolling with it. And that can be a little bit of an awkward situation. That was also backed up by a bunch of Eldar Craft World shooting in Hornets and Lynxes, and just using those racks to take table space and uh, create space between the Eldar artillery and your opponent's army. Now, the Dimacrons actually interact pretty interestingly with racks. Like a lot of other Horde-style units, racks don't actually really deal damage to your opponent's army. They do have 4 plus poison, which is annoying for big monsters, but they don't have any AP value. So the Dimacarons just being able to bounce a lot of their attacks with a 3 plus armor save and then heal that with uh, accelerated digestion makes it very difficult for the racks to actually, like, deal meaningful damage to the Dimacarons. And a lot of times the Dimacarons can pretty reliably trigger their Thorax Spine Maw attack on those racks because they there's just too many models to pull them out, all out of melee, especially if you're rolling an invulnerable save on them. So they actually don't take too much damage from the initial attacks that the Dimacaron has. Then that triggers the Spine Maw. You deal a bunch of D6 mortal wounds to the unit. You force some morale checks, assuming that they're not in that the correct turn for power from pain. And uh, these racks start falling apart pretty quickly. With the number of support and utility units that the Tyranid army has in the back as well, they can screen out a lot of the really good repositions for Black Cornucopians also. And that just makes it very difficult to respawn those racks on the table. And the Dimacarons can then like deal a bunch of damage and then use those units as kind of a springboard to get to the Lynxes and the artillery in the back line, since they can fall back in charge using the High Fleet Kraken adaptation. So not super surprising to me that this event was so one-sided in John's favor. I think he played the matchup pretty well and uh, was able to sort of force his opponent out of uh, really being able to fight. Also, the, just the, the, the high volume of anti-infantry shooting in John's army must have helped. There isn't a lot in this Eldar list that fights back at those Termagants super well. You can you can divert the Hornets to shoot them with the, the uh, plasma shots and the missile launchers, but that means you're not shooting at the Macarons and the Macarons probably don't die. So uh, it's kind of a catch-22 on the Eldari part there. The Termagants don't have a great profile at hitting the racks. They are T5 into a 4-plus and vulnerable save, which is pretty annoying to get through, but you just have like 90 shots, dude. Like, you'll get there eventually. You'll, you'll, you'll start chewing those units up. And that brought us to the final round. John was playing against... You ready for this? Another Terminator Heavy Space Marine build. So he's like nailing it on terms of good matchups today. This one was Dark Angels. So bringing a bunch of Deathwing Command Squads as well as a big Terminator Assault Squad to make use of that sweet uh, inner circle keyword. We also had two Talon Masters and three units of three attack bikes to bring some anti-tank shooting. And again, I imagine this is a situation where John was going to be able to use his distance from the opponent to fade the attacks of those multi meltas and and make it difficult for them to attack the Dimacarons without exposing themselves too much and just getting killed by the counter battery. And as soon as those attack bikes, you know, get too aggressive and move up to try to hit the monsters on the turreted side of the table, you just pick them all up with shooting. They are relatively difficult to kill in Ravenwing, but they're not they're not too hard and Exocrines and Hiveguard are pretty good at killing those guys. And once they're dead, there's very little that stops those Dimacarons from just running around the table and doing whatever they want. And this is another situation where, like, a Dimacaron going into a Terminator Assault Squad, the Terminators often don't want to pull out of melee with it, so it just gets the extra D6 Mortal Wounds. Voracious Appetite is also really good at getting through that inner circle keyword. Despite the fact that they have that permanent transhuman, you can reroll your wound rolls against it, and you're basically attacking normally. And then every single failed 4-plus and vulnerable save is a dead Terminator in that situation. So... 
it's just so hard for these move five models to like get up the table and fight these big monsters on their own terms. You do have the Talon Masters in there, which are pretty good at doing it, but you have to also protect them super well because if the Dimacron just jumps over the Terminators and kills the Talon Master and runs away, like you just lose that that amount of shooting as, uh, on top of it. Uh, this this can't have been an easy matchup for the Terminators, and uh, it, it sounds like John was able to to uh, dispatch them relatively easily. And with that, he won the tournament. <laughs> Congratulations to John. He definitely took a list that was well tuned into the metagame. Looking down the roster, I didn't see any Adeptus Mechanicus, and I only saw one or two Sisters players that didn't do very well. They went like uh, three and two or something, which is uh, frankly surprising to me, and, but I mean, really good for this big Tyranid list that's going to be able to run around those matchups that don't have that super high volume of anti-tank shooting to kill those Dimacarons. The Castellan matchup could have gone south, I think, assuming that the Castellan had uh, gone first and been able to kill one of the Dimacarons and at least bracket the second one to the point where it couldn't come back and, and fight. But sometimes you just gotta, you know, roll the hard six and win the roll to go first and kill that Castellan on turn one. There's not a lot you can do. A, a lot of times you can't t tech yourself into every single matchup in the metagame in 40k, so sometimes you just gotta win the roll to go first, you know? But it sounds like he also played some incredible games at 40k, so huge congratulations to John for winning with Tyranids. And that puts Tyranids on the board for winning GTs in real life events in ninth edition. Super excited for how well Tyranids are doing right now. They are a very competitive option. And while they aren't like super top tier and they do have some bad matchups into the metagame, man, if you're able to dodge your bad matchups or, you know, tech appropriately into them, Tyranids are, are so solid. Incredible maneuverability on top of good artillery and pretty decent hitting power is super duper good in ninth edition. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. Also, big thanks to my, all my supporters over at Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. Also, the YouTube channel members, you can join them in the link down below the video. They get early access to new videos and some exclusive videos as well. I'm also streaming a lot on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tactical tortoise TV. Go give me a follow. All the VODs for that get added to my second channel. There's a link for that down in the description as well. Tactical Tortoise TV. So if you want to watch those, uh, after they come off the Twitch archive, you can uh, just go do that over there. So highly recommend you check that out. Anyway, thanks again for watching, everyone. Hope you have a good one. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.